The second officer of the Lai Imun stated that in the four months that he had been with the ship, he had not seen any charts. He mentioned this to the third officer, fathering him. He did not think it was his duty to ask for a chart that a captain should offer them. Captain Weber kept the charts in his cabin, though, and the chart was never in the wheelhouse. The officers simply steered according to the captain's orders. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? Lai Yi Moon wrecks beneath the light. Here we are. Enjoy! The Lai Yi Moon had a long career before the subject of where her charts were kept entered public discussion. The Lai Yi Moon had started life in 1859 as a 1,925-ton paddle steamship that had been built for the opium trade in China. She was an unusually fast ship for her time, with a maximum speed of 16 knots, and this speed led to her being used during the American Civil War as a blockade runner. Once the war was over, she returned to Hong Kong, now as a mail steamer. But in 1872, she was rammed and sunk while in the harbor. For the Lai Moon, this was not the end of her career. She was raised, remodeled, and refitted. Her paddles were replaced by a screw propeller as a part of this, turning her into a more modern ship. The remodeled ship was purchased by the Australasian United Steam Navigation Company, or ASNC in 1876. They were looking for an express ship to run the route between Sydney and Melbourne, and Lai Moon had lost only a little of her speed with her remodel. Whether or not it slowed her down, it was considered a needed improvement to reduce her fuel costs, which were called ruinous. Even after she remodeled, she kept a strongly raking design of her masts and funnels, which one newspaper compared to the build of the Queen's yacht, and which an author in the 1920s referred to as giving her a dishonest appearance. The Lai Moon's distinctive build made her a much commented on ship, but only a couple of years after arriving in Australia, another accident struck. While docked in the company yard of the ASNC for maintenance, a fire burned the Lai Yi Moon so that she was practically gutted. Even still, her career was not at an end. This time, the rebuilt Lai Yi Moon was shaped to the standards of the day for luxurious passenger travel, including white enamel and gold paint to decorate her interior and the removal of one of her masts. Her high speed and fashionable furnishing made her a popular ship with passengers until the night of May 30th. 1886, when her career would come to a final and abrupt end. At noon on Saturday, the 29th of May, the Lai Yi Moon left Melbourne with her destination being Sydney. On board, she carried a cargo of mixed goods for various ports, a crew of 41 and 55 passengers. The weather was clear and calm, and there was no reason for the passengers to be concerned, as Saturday passed uneventfully. Around eight that night, the captain retired to his cabin for an hour. There was still no cause for concern, though the seas were getting a little choppier. At that time, they were off Gabo Island, and he left instructions as to the course that she should take while he was below and gave instructions that he should be called up to the deck again when the ship neared the Green Cape. The exact instructions that Captain Weber left for Third Officer Fotheringham would later become a matter of debate, as would many of the other details. What was known was that around 9.30 at night, the Lai Yi Moon struck the rock that lay right below Green Cape. This was in spite of a new and modern lighthouse that had been built only a few years before and was described as shining brightly to warn passing ships of the danger presented by what was called Danger Bay. 
it was true that the Lai Yi Moon was not the first ship to come to grief in that location, but it was the one that left the most questions. This was not a situation where a gale should have impacted the ship's course, and the lighthouse was in good working condition, giving a clear warning of the rocks. In the moment before the Lai Yi Moon struck, her engines were reversed. A clear acknowledgement of the danger that she was in but it was too late. The Lai Yi Moon had the custom of traveling around twelve and a half knots on her regular voyages between Melbourne and Sydney, and when she struck the rocks, it was with enough force that she began to break apart. Within ten minutes, she had broken entirely in half. The forepart of the ship drifted toward the shore, but it caught broadside on some of the rocks. The aft of the ship stuck on the reef that had proven the end of the Lai Yi Moon's career. A majority of the passengers had been below deck when the ship had struck the rocks. For the steerage passengers, nine men in total, and the firemen and engineers, there was no chance of escape. The stern of the ship had held a majority of the crew at the time of the accident, as well as the ship's first officer. The precarious position of the stern of the ship on the rocks meant that the waves were constantly battering it until it broke apart completely. None of them would reach the shore. A majority of the passengers had been in the forward part of the ship in the saloon class, but this too did not offer any safety. The stairs that would have taken them up onto the deck had broken away when the ship had broken in two, and anyone who did not reach the deck before that found that there was no way that they could find to escape as the ship filled with water. The only exceptions to this were one of the ship's stewards, who managed to pull himself through a porthole, a medical student named William Johnston, who had been pulled from the porthole by the captain and third officer, and a twelve-year-old boy. The twelve-year-old boy, named Harry Adams, had been traveling with his mother and little sister and had gone to find them when the ship started to break apart. He had been asleep when the ship wrecked, but had woken up to the collision, and the sight of the men around him dressing had alerted him that something was wrong. Harry Adams found his mother and sister and had been with them for a little while, but in the dark and confusion he had lost them again. In search of escape and air, he had climbed up to a portal and opened it. Above him, he found Reverend Poole and Mr. Lumidane, who were also both traveling in the saloon class, and who managed to make it to the deck before the stairs broke away. Seeing the head of a boy poke through a porthole, the two men pulled the boy up and placed him on the ship's rigging for safety. Reverend Poole, another passenger in the saloon class, had also been asleep when the ship had wrecked, waking up to the grating of a keel on rocks. He jumped out of bed and rushed to the deck. Realizing that he was not properly dressed, he then rushed back to his cabin to grab clothing. As he exited his cabin, with his clothing in his hands, he found that the saloon was now filled with steam. Not bothering to get dressed below, Reverend Poole returned to the deck to get dressed just as the ship parted in half. He had narrowly avoided being among those trapped. The crew and the passengers alike were forced to treat up to the rigging of the ship as the ship sank. Heavy seas were now washing over the wreck, and they were forced to cling to what they could in order to not be swept away. The foremast finally fell, but it fell in such a way that it was resting against the rocks. The ship's bosun and three of the sailors managed to make it safely to shore using this as a bridge. Only one female passenger had reached the deck before it was impossible to do so, and the third officer, Fotheringham, decided to try to bring her to shore. He had almost reached a place where they would be safe when a large wave full of wreckage struck them, and she was dealt a fatal blow. Finding that his life was now also in danger, Fotheringham turned around and returned to the wreck, only saving himself by grabbing onto the leg of another sailor. This sailor was also returning to the wreck. 
he had been trying to reach the shore on the mast when the ship had been struck by the same wave that had ended Fotheringham's attempt. The mast was now broken and could no longer be used as a bridge. On shore, the men who had managed to cross on the mast before it broke were met by the lighthouse keeper and his crew. The lighthouse was not equipped with any rocket, lifeboat, or anything else they could use to reach the people who they could see shipwrecked right in front of them. With the men from the Lai E Moon by their side assisting them, the lighthouse keeper and his men began the work of trying to get a rope to reach the bow of the wrecked ship so they could pull people ashore. It was not an easy task. Not being willing to not play a role in their own rescue, Captain Weber requested that a sailor named Berglund go into the forehold and bring up a rope. Berglund agreed, though there was a serious risk to his own safety, and succeeded in bringing up the rope that would be of great help. The bosun of the Lai E Moon, who was one of the men who had reached the shore, finally managed to reach the ship by tying a brass bolt to a piece of fishing line. This was then tied to the rope brought up by Berglund, and they finally had a path to the shore. It would be an estimated five and a half hours before a line was finally attached between the shore and the wrecked ship, and during this time, two of the passengers had succumbed to the elements. One of these two was the medical student that had been pulled through the porthole by the captain and third officer. None of the people who were still clinging to the rigging were in good condition. The waves had mercilessly beat against them, and it had taken a toll. One by one, they were pulled to shore by the lighthouse keeper and his men, who had worked through the night to try to reach them. The only exception was Harry Adams, who had fallen unconscious, though he remembered asking the captain if he could go to shore. One of the sailors carried him with him along the line and brought him to the lighthouse in a condition that made everyone fear for him. Fortunately, the lighthouse keeper's wife was able to care for him sufficiently that he would make a full recovery, though the experience had been a traumatic one. Through the night, the people who had been holding the rigging of the ship had heard cries from the stern of the wrecked Lai E Moon, but they had no way to reach them. Several other ships had passed by during this time, but the captains of these ships, when they learned what had happened, explained that it was dark, and there had been no signs of distress. They had seen lights on the shore, and assumed that people were fishing. If they had realized what had actually happened, they would have definitely done what they could to render assistance. When dawn broke, it was found that the stern was gone, broken to pieces in the night. Over the wrecked bow was the ship's bell, still hanging from the mast and tolling in the wind in a way that the people who witnessed it found haunting. A solemn reminder that out of the 96 people who had been on board of her, only 15 of them had reached the shore to tell their story. The problem was piecing those stories together. The lighthouse keeper was quick to report that it had not been a stormy night, and that the light of the lighthouse had been shining brightly. Captain Weber admitted both of those facts. He protested that he had not been called up to the deck until two minutes before the ship struck, which had not given him enough time to correct the navigation mistake, and it was clear that a navigation mistake had been made. At 8.45, the Lai E Moon had made a turn to port, in the direction of the land, to avoid an oncoming ship. Not only was this against protocol, the Lai E Moon should have turned to starboard, but the course was also never changed back. The Lai E Moon had continued towards the land without anyone realizing the danger. Soon after the accident, the representatives of the ASNC company, which owned the Lai E Moon, were asked if they had a policy that would mean that their ships were expected to remain close to shore. They would respond that, on the contrary, their company had a strict policy that stated that ships should not come closer than two miles to any underwater danger or land, and that if it was strictly necessary that the ship should do so, the captain had to be in command of the vessel. 
they were reluctant to make a definite statement of what had caused the wreck. But in spite of Captain Weber's long and respected career, as well as his experience with the route, they could only assume that it had been caused by some sort of negligence. The inquest would become a tangle of conflicting stories, as both Captain Weber and Third Officer Fotheringham tried to direct the blame for the accident at one another. Captain Weber said that he had instructed Fotheringham that the ship could go within half a mile of the wreck. Fotheringham said that the instruction had been that Captain Weber wanted the ship to pass within half a mile of the lighthouse. The Lai e Moon had been between half and a quarter mile from the lighthouse when she struck. Captain Weber said that he had only been on deck for two minutes before the ship struck. Fotheringham disagreed. He said that he had called Captain Weber 17 minutes before the accident and that he had heard Captain Weber's voice in the wheelhouse seven minutes or so before the wreck giving directions to the man at the wheel. These times were not a definite thing, though. Fotheringham made them seem as though they were. There was no way to see the clock from the bridge of the ship. Though there were crates of cabbages on the deck which might have obstructed the view ahead in the wheelhouse for Captain Weber, Fotheringham insisted that Captain Weber had been able to see over them. The wheelsman, who had been steering the ship until eight that night, seemed to agree. He had been able to see the Green Cape Lighthouse while in the wheelhouse, even while they had been off Cape Howe. He said that whoever the lookout was should have been able to see the breakers off Green Cape from more than a mile away. Captain Weber told the inquest that he had called out to Fotheringham, asking him why he had not been called up sooner, or at least before they got so close to the rocks. Fotheringham protested that he had not rebuked him at all about the course, but instead had simply shouted to him to silence the ship's whistle. When the ship's second officer, John Hutchinson, testified, he focused mostly on the lack of charts available to the crew and their reliance on Captain Weber to give directions to them. He could not say without a chart whether a ship steered due north from Cape Howe would clear Green Cape. He also said that after he had woken up, when the ship struck, he demanded from Fotheringham if the captain had been on deck. And Fotheringham had told him at the time that Captain Weber was in the wheelhouse giving directions. Hutchinson admitted that on seeing the condition of the ship after reaching the deck, he had thought he was facing his final moments. Through the inquest, as well as subsequent investigations and criminal proceedings, Captain Weber and Fotheringham continued to point fingers at one another. Eventually, the authorities were forced to drop the charges against both men. They simply did not have enough evidence to determine which of the men had been in command of the ship at the time of the disaster, and who had the responsibility of changing the ship's course to bring her to safety. Due to the strong public interest in the wreck, there was soon a fund raised, but this soon turned into a matter of some public debate. A part of the cargo that the Lai E Moon had carried was the complete costume and set collection of a theatrical company. The company had arrived in Sydney safely, but they had lost everything that they would need to put on a show with the Lai E Moon. There was a suggestion that part of the fun be given to them so that they could get back on their feet, but many of the people who had donated were outraged at the idea. Many people had lost cargo with the Lai E Moon, but when they donated, they had been considering the widows and orphans, as well as the survivors of the wreck, not those who had lost property. There also would be questions within the government about proper safety measures for ships sailing the coasts of Australia. While there was some concern about a lack of life-saving methods available to the lighthouse keeper, their focus was far more on the lack of life-saving methods available to those who had been on board the Lai E Moon. The statements made by the captains of the vessels that had passed the wreck 
that they had not seen any signs of distress were quickly explained when it was found that the Lai Yi Moon had not carried rockets to signal for help. There also had not been any flotation devices available to the passengers or crew aboard the ship to aid them in getting to shore. It was an oversight of safety that ASNC had been guilty of before on other ships in their line that had wrecked. And after such a disaster, the government felt a need to step in. New regulations ordering adequate safety equipment on ships traveling the coast of Australia were passed. A graveyard was created near the lighthouse to remember those lost, not all of whom were ever identified. On the memorial, some of the steerage passengers were remembered simply as an unknown Greek man who had been given passage at the request of the cook, and two unknown men, one of whom had a German accent. The exposed position of the wreck of the Lai Yi Moon meant that little of her would remain for long, leaving the little graveyard all that was left of a ship with a long and storied career. For more information, please see the Melbourne Argus from the 1st of June, 1886, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.